Okay, now we're down to the nitty-gritty, the important part, more important than even the singing, although that's very, very important. Uh, we're down to what we came for. We want something from the Bible. And Brother Bemis has always loaded us down that way, and uh, so we're in great expectation of uh, this meeting this week. And uh, I don't know how things are going to go, but I feel like we're going to get everything we need and probably a double dose of it. We went out to the restaurant today, and Nathan signed the... Uh, register there, uh, Kalispell, Montana, and he signed it, uh, the comments and said everything was excellent, don't change anything. And so that's what we want. We've had good meetings with Brother Bemis. Don't change anything, Brother. Just unload on us. We'll take all you got. Brother Bemis. Hey. All right. Glad to see you again. And somebody says, what do you, what do you write down there? Don't change nothing. Everybody wants to change something, try and change things out, and they really didn't need to change a thing. Just do what the book says. Amen? You do what the book says, and you'll come out uh, shining success. Uh, I had a good trip out here. I got on the plane 5 o'clock uh, and started flying. I had 10 minutes in Salt Lake and to sit down before I got on the plane. And I had 10 minutes in Cincinnati uh, to sit down before I got on that plane. And I got in here uh, just, uh, I mean, zip, 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 and had a good flight, and everything went good, and got here in a hurry. And I'm uh, excited about preaching to you, and glad to see you this evening, and pray that God speaks to your heart tonight and does something for you. Now, my job is to help you as a saint of God. And so I want you to get your Bible out and get a piece of paper now. And like always, I've named my messages and, uh, and, uh, and each one of them has a name to them. And uh, the name of my message uh, this evening is How to Jumpstart a Christian. Now, not how to jumpstart a car, but how to jumpstart a Christian. Now, I want you to take your Bible and turn to the key verse. Turn to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. All right. In Galatians chapter 5, I want you to look at verse 7. Now, the saint of, the saint of God, uh, I, I'm pretty sure I'm talking to Christians tonight, but if I'm talking to an unsaved person and you need to jump start, I, I might be starting preaching to you too. But Christians are the ones that get backslidden and get kind of dead on the side of the road is what's happening to them. Ye did run well. You're running a Christian race. You're running as a runner, running a race. Ye did run well. Now circle the next word. What does it say? Everybody say it one more time. Who? Now I don't know who the who is, but chances are it's somebody. Somebody has waylaid you and got you dead on the side of the road. Who did hinder you? That you should not do what? Obey what? Obey the truth. So a Christian is supposed to be doing something. What's he supposed to be doing? Finding a verse of Scripture to obey. Now are you finding a verse of Scripture that you can obey? Then if, you're, if you don't have a verse to obey and you're not looking for one, saying, the Lord, help me obey that one, help me obey that one. Now, Lord, that one, mm, boy. <laughs> I'm going to go to the next one. <laughs> Lord, help me obey that one. <laughs> Y'all with me? You ain't going to obey every verse in that Bible. Say amen. You're not going to do it. Now, I don't know a man in this world that's obeyed every single verse. But there's some you can obey. So you find out the ones you say, Now, Lord, give me another verse to obey it. And when the Christian's not obeying that, he's dead on the side of the road and he's not obeying that book right there. Now let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, 
I pray tonight, uh, by your grace and by your mercy, Father, that you would please open up our hearts. And Lord, I pray that you would open up our understanding. And I pray that tonight you would speak to that Christian. I don't know who he is or who she is that's dead on the side of the road, but Lord, I pray by the grace of God that you give them a jump start and get going again and get back in the battle and be back to be obeying your precious word. In Jesus' name I pray, and for his sake, amen. Now, you get dead on the side of the road, a Christian does. Now, maybe you're not dead on the side of the road, but maybe you know somebody that is. So you need to write some things down. How to get a Christian jump-started. Now, any of you here tonight that know some Christian that needs a jump start? Anybody? Raise your hand if you know some Christian. You ought to know some Christian <laughs> that needs a jump start. Might even be yourself that needs to get going again. <laughs> and you got to get it because you'll get there, brother. Now, uh, it's like this. Uh, my son John uh, got married, and, and they, him and his wife bought a, a nice new little car. And John is kind of wild, you know, and he uh, drove up to this big parking lot, had a great big old blacktop parking lot out there, and the water wasn't running off the parking lot. And he looked in there, and the water was probably maybe uh, 100 feet this way and another 100 feet that away, and looked in it, and he said, well, it's probably about a foot deep, so I'm going to drive my car through it. So he gets it and he grits his teeth and he says, hang on, you guys. And <laughs> just going real fast and down through there he goes. Man, water flying everywhere. And it got deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. And then he stalled it right in the middle and the, wa and the water's coming in the window. <laughs> in the window. He says, we got to bail out, you guys. Got to bail out. <laughs> And they crawled out the wind, they all crawled out the wind, and he said, Nah, boy, my dad's going to kill me, my wife's going to kill me. Come on, you guys, help me push it out of here. And they grit their teeth, and they pushed the car out of there. Water's running out everywhere. He went in zipping, boy. And he gets in, starts it up, and nothing, it ain't going to start. It ain't going to start. He says, I'll call my dad. He'll help me. He knows how to get my car going again. And so he calls me up and says, Dad, I done a dumb trick. And I says, uh, what did you do, John? And I think he's rolled it, you know, or something like that, you know. <laughs> he said, I went through a, a water up here at the store and drowned my car out, and you got to come up and help me get started again so I can go home. I said, I'll help you. I know just what to do. I got my truck, went up there, and I says, uh, what we got to do is we got a port to get it started. You get in, and when I pull a little ways, and you pop the clutch, and turn on the, the key, and pop the clutch, and man, we'll get it going. And I hooked on to him, and I started pulling, and I said, Pop the clutch, John! And <laughs> man, we drove that thing around that parking lot in a circle like that for about 10 minutes. I'm dragging him as hard as I could drag him. And we come out, I said, did it start? And he said, no, Dad didn't start. Well, I don't know what's wrong. Right? I don't know either. You, I guess you'll have to call the garage. So he calls the garage, and I leave and take him home. Next day, the garage comes down and gets it into the garage, and the garage tells him, well, you went through a big water hole, mud hole, didn't you? Yeah, I went through a big water hole. Well, it filled it up. All the cylinders got water on top of the cylinders and they were plumb full of water, and then because you tried to start it, it uh, with the water on top of the cylinders, you bent all the rods. Ah, <laughs> uh, my son never forgive me for his smartness of starting his car. It wiped out his engine. They said all the rods are bent, every one of them are bent. That, you might as well chuck the engine. And he said, it's, it's under warranty, isn't it? And then they argued back and forth and argued back and forth, and they finally they said, it's under warranty. We'll put a new engine in it. <laughs> put a new engine in it, but I'll tell you something. Be careful when you try to jumpstart a Christian. You might bend all the rods. 
You better do it the right way according to the book. You might not, you might, you might take, I'm going to get this Christian right with God. I'm going to straighten up. Man, I'm going to get him going from God. And you might bend all his rods. Joe, you might do it, just hurt him and hammer him. He might get so mad, he'll just quit and never serve God again, never go back to church again, never read his Bible again, never do nothing again. Because you did it the wrong way. Be careful when you try to jumpstart a Christian. I'll tell you one thing, one how not to jumpstart a Christian. Don't do it in a critical spirit. You try to jumpstart a Christian in a critical spirit, you'll kill him. You won't jumpstart a Christian by criticism. That won't jumpstart a Christian. There's a certain way to jumpstart a Christian, and I want to give them to you. Number one, number one, make sure, make sure. Now, many a time when I'd be a teenager growing up, I would buy just a dollar's worth of gas. That's all I could afford. <laughs> I'd buy a dollar's worth of gas, and I'd drive that thing till that dollar's worth of gas would be just about out, and then I'd stop and get another dollar's worth. And then I'd drive it again till that dollar's worth is up, and then I'd stop again and buy another dollar's worth. <laughs> but you know what happened? Lots of times I'd run out of gas. And I'd get out of gas, and I'd get up over there, and I'd open up the hood and take the, the, the you know, that, uh, that uh, what do you call it, the thing that's over top of the carburetor? Air filter, thank you. <laughs> and take off the air filter, and then I'd uh, get a little gas, you know, because when you're running completely out of gas, they won't start because they're completely out, and they got to get some gas from the tank back up. And so I pour a little bit of gas down the carburetor. Boy, when you started, it goes, wham, man, boy, the gas goes off, and I mean, blows all the gaskets out of that baby. <laughs> and, but, I mean, it gets it going, gets it going, gets out of gas. So, number one, sometimes my car and your car gets dead on the side of the road because it's out of gas. A car will not run with gas <laughs> without it. <laughs> Without gas, <laughs> won't run with it. Yeah, a lot of them won't run with it. <laughs> but lots of times, see, it ain't always gas, but a lot of times it's a gas. Now, what's gas? Gas is this. Take your Bible and write it down. No car, every Christian could be dead on the side of the road if he has no gas in him. Now, you know what the gas is? The gas is the Word of God. You've got to get him back in the Word of God. You've got to get him back in that book. You got to desire him to want to get the Bible, read the Bible, meditate in the Bible, and soak the Bible in him, John. If you find a Christian on the dead side of the road, you got to say, now what you got to do is get back to that book, and you've get gotten away from that book, and you're dead on the side of the road, and you can't run without gas. Say amen. You got to get your nose back in that book again and pick it up and start reading it again. Now, take your Bible and turn to the book of Proverbs, and I'll prove this to you. A Christian who has no gas in the gas tank, because you won't put enough gas in there, and you only put just a little bit in here, and a dollar's worth in, and a dollar's worth in. And if you just put uh, ten minutes on Sunday school worth, there ain't enough gas to get you going, keep you going. You with me? You all with me? If you, you get your Bible in Sunday school, and you've got ten minutes worth of gas in your tank, it ain't going to carry you through the week. You're going to run out of gas. You need more of that book than that. We're in a day and age where everybody's getting hammered and hammered and hammered and hammered, and one verse here and there. You know how a lot of Christians read their Bible? Like this. Lord, please give me something good today. That'll work once in a while. Once in a while, that'll work. That's a wonderful book. It'll work. It'll work for you. <laughs> uh, a guy was telling me about gold he found one day. He had a big old pound of gold like that one day, and, and I kind of envied it, you know. <laughs> I, you will do the same, too, if you saw a big old thing of gold that big another like that. And I said, boy, wouldn't that be nice to find somewhere or another? Big old, big old handful, two and a half ounces of gold and... You know, my mind goes, 
Gold is at least 300 and some dollars a bounce. Anybody know what gold is running an ounce right now? How much is gold an ounce? Anybody? 300 and some? Y'all don't know that? You're out of it. <laughs> gold is at least 300 and some uh, uh, dollars an ounce. And I envy that little bit. Just a little. And I said, Lord, there's a golden nugget in your book. And I know I'm not going to read the Bible and study the Bible like this, and I don't. But, Lord, give me a golden nugget. And went to Isaiah chapter 60, verse 8. That's where it went. Isaiah 60, verse 8. Take your Bible. I want to show you this golden nugget. Isaiah chapter 60 and verse 8. I want to show you the golden nugget the Lord gave me. Now, you know what you got to do? Get you back in the Bible again. That Christian's got to find him a golden nugget, and he's got to get something that will get the lump out of his throat. How many have ever had a lump in your throat? How many have a lump in your throat right now? If you've never had a lump in your throat, you haven't lived. You haven't lived, you've never had a lump. You know what the lump in the throat is, don't you? You say, what's the lump in the throat? It's, it's a lump like this that gets right there in the lump of your throat, and you feel like bawling and crying when somebody says you're stupid and you can't read. Anybody with me? Anybody with me? Or somebody says you're, you're fired! <laughs> Get a big old lump in your throat right there, there's a big lump choke you. Hey, you haven't never said you've been fired. Oh, yes, man, you've been fired. You're fired. <laughs> I mean, them are quite some words, boy. Put a lump in your throat, the biggest choke you to death. Or here's one. I'm divorcing you. Yeah, anybody with me? Here's one. I'm sorry, but they have cancer. You never had a lump in your throat? Here's one. I'm sorry, but there's nothing I can do. God will have to give you a miracle. Boy, that'll put a lump right there in your throat. And then we do what you'll have to do. You'll have to go to that book and say, God, give me a golden nugget. Give me a golden nugget, Lord. Give me a golden nugget. I can't get through unless you give me a golden nugget. Amen and amen, brother. And sometimes you'll have to just go like this. Oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. Give me a golden nugget. And I got one. Because I was envying a big old handful of gold. <laughs> and I knew I would never find no two and a half pound thing of gold because I didn't even look at <laughs> But I said, this thing here has got a bunch of golden nuggets in it that are worth 50 pounds of gold. And I found one. Here it is, Isaiah chapter 60, verse 8. Who are those that fly as a cloud and as a dove to their windows? And I said, what a golden nugget is that? And I said, something says, study it. Study it, study it, study it. I said, okay, all right, I'll study it. And I've had a dream hundreds of times of being on a magic carpet. Have I told you about my magic carpet dream? My magic carpet dream goes up like this and goes up like this and flies down through the valley and see all the beautiful sights down through the valley and up over the telephone boat and up over the mountains and about the time it gets ready to crash, I wake up. <laughs> and then I have it at least, I have it at least 100 to 200 times a year. At night, then I have it another 50 times in the daytime when I'm driving down the road in my car. <laughs> so you're not supposed to do that. <laughs> Out there in Montana, them roads are just like that, and there's nothing on this side and nothing on that there, and as flat as it can be on this side and flat as it can be on that side, and pretty soon you're just going down there 
dreaming about your magic carpet. <laughs> and then the Lord says, hey, study it. So I studied it. And I found there's three people in that uh, chapter. Number one, arise and shine. That's the Lord Jesus Christ coming back and shining at the advent. Arise and shine. I mean, getting up in the morning, brother, arise and shine. Here comes Jesus Christ. The advent's getting ready to come. On. And the Lord's saying, hey, you got something to look forward to. And then I found down there a bunch of Gentiles back and forth in there. And then I found some Jews back and forth in there. And then there's one more group. I find out that that's the millennium. You with me, brother? Say amen. Real loud so they can hear you. Amen. See, that's the millennium. So that's my future. You know what life is about? Life is forgetting the past and getting something good in the future. If you ain't got nothing in the future to live forward and look forward to, you know, life is miserable. I'm looking forward to something. I am. Who are those that fly as a cloud? There's one more group in the millennium. You've got the Jews in the millennium. You've got the Gentiles in the millennium. Who is the other group? Who's that other group, that third group in the millennium? You. You. The saints of God. Are you a saint of God? Are you going to reign with Jesus Christ in the millennium? Say amen. Then the who is me. Look at your words. The who is me. Who are those that what? Fly. Then when I get back and come back and get me a new body like Jesus, and I'm going to be like the angels of God in heaven, I get a fly on the magic carpet. I get a fly like a magic carpet, like a bird. And I'm going to do it without a magic carpet. My carpet's never going to crash. You talk about looking forward to something. Woo! Woo! A new body! You say forward, forward, ball, forward, ball. I said, Lord, thank you for that wonderful, mighty nugget. You know what's wrong with Christian? He's dead on the side of the road because this book in here, no more magic golden nuggets for him. So he's dead on the side of the road. There's no gas in the tank. You follow me? No gas in the tank. You got to get him back in that book and have it again where he's looking for a golden nugget in there and say, oh God, give me one. I just had somebody say I got cancer. I just had somebody say divorce. I just had somebody say you're going to get a miracle. You'll have to take a miracle from God. Get him back in the book and get him going again and get him something excited to shout about again. You with me? Then get him back in the book. Put some gas in the tank. Again, uh, number two, if there's gas in the tank, you've got to try different things because sometimes there's gas in the tank. I'd go, I'd go out there and I'd stop in the, my car, go on the side of the road and go, and it would stop. Dead. Now I'd get out and I'd say, man, it's got to be out of gas. Got to be out of gas. That's what it is, out of gas. So I'd get some gas, get a gas can, pour some down that, take off the air filter, pour a little down the carburetor, and I knew it was going to go bang again, and because it always did. And I'd get in there and start it up, and boom, bang! Still wouldn't start. Bang again! Still wouldn't start. So what do you got to do? If it ain't the gas, got plenty of gas in the gas tank, Got plenty of gas up in the carburetor, and you can smell the gas just rolling out of that baby. So you're not, you know it ain't gas. Then what has it got to be? You got to try something else. You with me? You got to try something else. Kind of like this. My car had a 50, uh, 55 Chevy, and had a 52 Chevy, and I would always park it on a hill. Drive it up, 
park it up on a hill there. Somebody says, what are you always parking on a hill for? I've got brains. A few. <laughs> what for? You've got to start it. You've got to get it going. What's the hill for? The hill is to get it rolling. Get it rolling just a little bit. You get it rolling a little bit, then you jump in, you pop the cushion, boy, it'll start every time. For I park on so many hills, for I park on the hill, park on the hill, park on the hill, park on the hill, park on the hill. Got to get that thing rolled. So it's got gas. What's another problem? It might be electricity. Might be a spark. They still run on sparks. They still run on electricity. You got to go through there like that. You got to go through there like that. And say, where's the park? One day I had an old Plymouth, and that Plymouth, the door wouldn't open on it. I couldn't get it open. And I had to slide across the, the seat and open up the other door and get out the other side. And, or crawl in the window. And most of the time it just crawled in the window. And I crawled in the window, my old Plymouth. I'm driving down the road right there. And here's a big old intersection right here. All of a sudden it stops right in the middle of the intersection. I crawled out the window and I was embarrassed. And it takes a lot to embarrass me. <laughs> and I crawled out of the window. Now the window I went and I thought, oh man, it's dead right here and I don't know nothing about this thing. I went up there and I said, I'm going to pretend I do. I opened up the hood and everybody's watching me honking in back there. Come on, young guy, come on. And I'm opening up the hood and I'm looking in there and I'm going, Oh, Lord, I know there's gas in it. I just bought a dollar's worth of gas. I know it's in there. And I'm looking, I'm scratching my head, and I'm saying, there's a wire. Now, wire went over to a little round thing called the coil. I think it is coil. And I said, maybe it ain't running because that wire come off of that little round thing. Maybe. Let me try it. Took that wire and hooked it back on that little round thing. I think it was a coil. I put down the hood and looked around like that. And went and climbed up in the window again. Hurt and hurt and start up. Ah, man, boy, I thought, <laughs> I can fix the car. <laughs> took off, boy. See, there was no spark. Now, when a Christian get on the side of the road, like some of you get, you know why? Because there's no spark. There's no spark. You say, what's the spark? Write it down. The spark is getting that Christian back into praying again. Get, getting him back to praying about everything that comes in his life. When you stop praying as a Christian and you your prayer life comes to zilch, you're dead on the side of the road, boy. Dead on the side of the road whether you're going to church or not. Dead, man. Why? No prayer life. No prayer life. And there's nothing, nothing can take its place. And But you've got to get him back in there praying again. Now you say, how do you get a Christian back in there praying again? You remind him how important it is to pray. And you remind him how important just a little prayer can be. Just a little prayer can be. And how that little prayer can make everything right with God again. And that little prayer can get God on your side. And God being where he says, okay, you really want my help? Yeah. So sometimes God has to drive you for prayer because you ain't been praying. He has to drive you there. And when he drives you to prayer, he has to give you something to pray about. So that something has to touch you right down here. So you have to have something that hurts you. You have to have something that just, just wrenches you because you ain't been praying. You're just going through that. I ain't talking about church prayer. I ain't talking about the preacher asking you to pray. I ain't talking about you praying with your wife. 
I'm talking about when you get down to God and say, my God, it ain't right. Lord, I'm mad. I'm just mad and it ain't right, God. It ain't fair. It shouldn't be this way. I can't understand it. Oh, God, why? That's the kind of prayer that some of you need to start praying. And if you don't, you're dead on the side of the road and you're going to stay dead. And people are going to say, oh, isn't she a wonderful sweetie? Oh, isn't she nice? Oh, isn't he nice? Didn't he love the Lord? No, they're dead on the side of the road. It's not how people look at you that count. It's how God looks at you that counts. It's not what people think of you. It's immaterial what people think of you. It's what God thinks of you that counts. And if you haven't got a prayer life with him where you reach God with your heart and steady your head, you're dead on the side of the road. And, and, and I beg you, oh, Christians, you know, it's like, it's like this. Prayer is like a tree without roots. He's all show. He smiles. He looks nice. He's polite. He smells like a Christian, looks like a Christian, and talks like a Christian, whatever that is. But down inside, he's as cold and dead as a mackerel on the beach for three weeks. Because there's no prayer. There's no pouring out his heart to God about anything. He's dead, 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 and he won't run. You've got to get some spark, boy. You've got to get some spark to you. Put some power there. You say, preacher, I got gas. And I got spark. Okay? All right. Now you, you, you're just about to get him roll. Go on. But you've got to try some things. You've got to keep on trying some things. Sometimes you've got to come along, and you've got to jumpstart that Christian, and here's how you do it. Take your Bible and, and turn to uh, J Jeremiah chapter 25. Jeremiah chapter 25. And sometimes you say, well, pretty sure he's got gas. That's good. Amen. You, you're in the Bible. You got them in the book. You got them in this version. They're memorizing the verse of Scripture. They're reading the Bible every day. They're reading the Bible every day. And, and they got some prayer, too. They got some prayer, too. You say, man, this guy's jump started. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. You say, well, he's, yes, he is, preacher. He's reading his Bible every day. What about that? Yeah, but that still could he could still be dead on the side of the road. I want you to listen now. I want you to listen. You say, I got prayer. I'm praying to the Lord. I'm praying. So, preacher, I ain't dead on the side of the road. I'm doing both of them. No, sir, not quite. Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 31. And none shall come even into the end of the earth, for the Lord hath a, Jeremiah 25, 31, he hath a what, folks? Now, what's, that, what's the word controversy mean? Controversy. That means the Lord has a controversy with that particular person. He has a controversy with them. Now, what's that controversy? Now, I don't know what the controversy is. That's where you and God are in an argument about something, and you won't deal with it, and you won't get it right. It's an argument between you and God. It's a controversy between you and God. And you're called that controversy there. Different things can cause a controversy. But that controversy comes along, and it comes with a little, it comes a little bit like this. Doest thou well to be angry, Jonah? And Jonah says, I do well to be angry, even unto death. Now, what Jonah said, Jonah in the belly and the wheel, and up in the city of Nineveh, and the whole city of Nineveh uh, repented to preaching to Jonah. 
for 40 days and 40 nights, 40 days and 40 nights, and God shall destroy Nineveh. And the whole city of Nineveh repented and got right. Say amen. And what Jonah do? He got mad. Why did Jonah have a controversy with God? Because he wouldn't forgive. Take your book and write it down. Because he would not forgive. He had a controversy with God and he wouldn't deal with it. And you can get a controversy with God Almighty. Get something between you and him on some subject and then it's kind of like this. A man gets mad at his wife. You don't ever do it? Come on. You never get mad at your wife? Come on. Who are you trying to kid? You ladies, do you ever get mad at him? Thank you. There's only one honest soul. <laughs> you say, what is that? That's a controversy. Now, what do you have to have in a controversy? Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Here's a man. I won't forgive her, and I'm not even going to talk about it. Here's a woman. I won't forgive him, and I'm not even going to talk about it. Then there's a controversy. And the controversy's not settled till you talk about it. Say amen. And I'm telling you the living truth. And if you think it's be settled because you won't talk about it, you got another thing coming. You got a controversy with God, and that controversy between you and God will stay there until you talk him over with it. You gotta beat around the bush. He comes and says, Oh Lord, uh, my boss wants to fire me. But Lord, I, I really don't want to be fired. And Lord, please don't don't <laughs> Lord, please don't fire me. Please keep, help me keep a job. Oh, God, please help me not get fired. And the Lord says, that ain't the issue. Got it? That ain't the issue. You come, oh, God, God, my son's sick, my son's sick. Oh, God, my son's sick. That ain't the issue. That ain't the issue. You got a controversy with God, and you got to talk to Him about the controversy. And we don't want to talk about the controversy. We'll talk about something else. But we don't want to talk about the controversy. You know what a lot of con controversy is sometimes? I'll tell you what it is sometimes. Sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. Okay, Lord. Why do you want to talk about? I'll talk about. Why don't you tell me what to talk about? And the Lord says, uh, you have been cheating on your tithing, and you haven't been tithing for months, bud. Now, you want to get that right? You want to talk about it? Yeah, Lord, I'll talk about it, and I'll get it right. Okay, now we're talking about Now again, we'll talk about whatever you want to now. Now we got the controversy. But maybe that's not it. You know what I do? I make sure that ain't it. So when I get a controversy between me and him, I said, now, Lord, the controversy ain't me given. And the controversy is not between me and Louise. I got that settled. It's not that. Lord, and I, okay, Lord, all right. If that's what you want me to do, okay. See, sometimes there's a controversy. You get in that car and you start it up and goes like this. There's a controversy. You get out, you say, put a bomb in it. Blow it up. Go buy a new one. Get in it a couple hours later and you go, and it won't start. So what is it? 
there's a controversy between you and God and you won't deal with a controversy you just stubborn boy stubborn boy I mean like that like a rock I'm not going to talk about it you can't make me talk about it and I don't want to talk about it well the Lord will do the same with you boy Okay, if you want to stay dead on the side of the road, you can stay dead on the side of the road. Jonah never got his bitterness right with God. Last thing you hear is Jonah saying, I am be bitter even unto death. Cross is okay, if that's where you want to be fine. He never said, Oh, I just want a whole city and a whole bunch of folks got saved. Ha <laughs> ha! He didn't never did say that. You know where Lot you know where Lot died? You know the last thing you hear of Lot? Saint Lot. He committed incest in the cave with his two daughters. Am I telling them the truth? Am I telling them the truth? You say, what for? You can get in a controversy with God and stay in the controversy for twenty years. Is that what you want to do? Stay 20 years in a controversy with God because you won't settle a controversy? And it'll be there, buddy. It'll be there to you say you'll face it. Yeah, you will face it. But you know when that'll be? That'll be when you grow old, drop dead, step out of your body, and go to the judgment seat of Christ. And step into the judgment seat of Christ, and the Lord says, Now, do you want to talk about it? And you say, But, but Lord, but Lord. He said, Now, do you want to talk about it? But wait a minute. My Bible says He forgives, and He also does what, folks? Forgets. Then you've got to settle the controversy. He forgives if you ask Him. If you ask Him, He forgives. If he, you don't ask, there is still a controversy. I'll prove it to you. Just never ask your wife to forgive you and see if she forgives you with you never asking her. I hammered her, but I never forget. I never asked for forgiveness, and I'm not going to ask for forgiveness. She's just going to have to automatically ask me. You are wacko. He wants you to ask for forgiveness. So does he. So does he. Say amen. Everybody wants to ask for, you ask for forgiveness, I'll forgive you in a heartbeat. Ask for it, I'll forgive you. Ask for it. You, you offend me, ask me to forgive you, I'll forgive you. Any word of would. Same thing goes with God. One of these days you're going to stand there and the Lord's going to say, now, let's talk about it now. And you're going to say, but Lord, but Lord, but Lord. And the Lord's going to say, yes, let's talk. You say, can you prove that in the Bible? Yeah, I can prove it in the Bible. Take your Bible and turn to Colossians. And turn to Colossians chapter 3. In case you think that I'm just trying to get you to do something which I am, I'm trying to get you to do something. I'm trying to get you jump-started. <laughs> now, look at it. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. And uh, in chapter 3, look at verse 23. Notice what it says. Colossians three twenty-three. Are you with me? Say amen. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartedly as in the Lord and not unto men. Knowing that the Lord, ye shall receive the, what? Now, is reward salvation or is salvation a gift? How many say salvation is a gift? Is it a free gift? It's real loud. Then this is not salvation, is it? This is not salvation. This is what a Christian does after he's saved. A reward 
of the inheritance. This is the inheritance that you get by, by working for the Lord. For you what? Serve. This has to do with you serving the Lord. You get that inheritance. You get a reward. That's an inheritance. It's like an inheritance your mom and daddy are going to give you. You're going to give your children some inheritance, Lord willing. You're going to give your children some inheritance, Lord willing. Say amen. I hope you are. Going to give them a little bit of an inheritance. But they get it because they're children. It's automatic. But they also get an inheritance because they're a certain type of child. You're a child of God, you're going to get a certain type of an inheritance. Now look at the next verse. The next verse says, But he that doeth wrong, underline the word right and wrong. Did it say wrong? Circle it in your Bible. Circle it. Is it right or is it wrong? Is it, is it right? Did that say right? Did it say right, folks? Did it say wrong? What did it say? It said wrong. So it's right or wrong. If it's right, it's good. It's right. If it's wrong, it's sin. And so what? Now look at it. But he that doeth wrong shall receive of the wrong which he hath done. And there is no respect of persons. Who is he talking about? Talking about a Christian at the judgment seat of Christ. That the same man at the judgment seat of Christ receiving wrong which he has done. You say, what is it? You're going to have a loss. You're going to have come down through there and the Lord going to say, why, you and I had a controversy and I asked you about it and talked to you about it and I preached to you from the pulpit on it and I give you time after time and you just said, I don't want to talk about it. Gotcha. Now do something about it. You're dead on the side of the road. Get going for God again. Don't stay dead on the side of the road. He'll be like a Jonah. Get going for him. Number four. Number four. In order to jumpstart a Christian and get him going again, you have got to remind him what the Lord has done for him. Underline it. You've got to remind him for what the Lord has done for him. You know what happens to a Christian? He gets dead in the side of the Lord, right at the side of the road because he forgets. He forgets what God did for him. Now, how many of you, God saved you, and God saved you from going... Let's put it this way. How many of you have ever taken a drink? Raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Boy, thank God he saved you from some drink. And well, 13, 14. Then how many of you went into a bar to get that drink? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven, eight, nine, ten, 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 there you go again. He saved you from a lot. Man, the thing that he saved you from. Saved you from a bar and a drunken life and a wasted life with the bar flies and the smell and the stink and the destruction and the terrible... How many of you have never had a drink? Never had a drink in your life? That's what God saved you from. If you hadn't got saved from it, you would run right down that road. And say, you say, what did you save you from? Woo! What did he save you from? Have you ever met a drunk? My daddy was a drunk. My, da my daddy was a drunk all his life. My daddy, I seen him beat down the back door and beat up my mother. Hammer back down and hammer that back door down and come in there as drunk as he could do it and beat up my mother and drank and I'd look for my daddy and he'd be in a bar drunk. And I'd look for my daddy 10, 11 years old and he'd be in a bar drunk. And I'd look for my daddy 
when I was 16 years old and he'd be in a bar drunk. I look for him 17, 18, 19 years old and my daddy would be in a bar drunk. I'll tell you what God saved you from. He saved you from a bar and a bunch of drunks. How many have ever stolen anything? Thank God not too many thieves around. <laughs> See what God saved you from. Now, if you ever stole something, I'll tell you what it's like. At night, midnight, go in and steal some hubcaps off of a car. I'd sneak around there. I'd look this way and look that way and look this way and look that way. And that guy's car would be out in front of the house and I'd go up and take a screwdriver and pop that hubcap off and go up and popped the front hubcaps off and all oh, mouth thought them hubcaps were a really big deal and went over and popped that hubcap off and popped that hubcap off and about the time I would hear this guy I'd ask oh man I'm going to get caught and I'd take off running with them hubcaps I'd just run as hard as I could with them hubcaps and I'd get through and I'd get down the road and I'd go oh, I did something awful wicked man I should never stole them hubcaps I never stole them hubcaps I should never stole them hubcaps I shouldn't do that. That's a thief. Well, God, I don't want to be a thief. What if you grow up being a thief? Nothing but a dirty, rotten thief. God saved you something from something, boy. God saved you from something. How many have ever gambled? If you eat, gamble, get in there and get down there and get... Start playing those cards back and forth and get that in you, boy. Say, I'm going to win the big pot today, boy. Ooh, I'm going to win the big pot today. And I'm pretty sure you're trying to win the big pot today and the big pot tomorrow and the big pot the next day and the big pot the next day. And you're spending the money that went should have went to the baby's diapers. And you're spending there. And it went, should have went on insurance. And it went there. To the, and then it should have went to pay the car payment. Man, it's going right here and the car payment's behind and the baby don't have diapers and there's food not on the table because you're down there trying to hit the big one. Boy, did God save you from something. Woo! What did God save you from? Man, alive, did God save you from something. You know what God saved me from? When I got saved, I could not read one lick of the, of the word in the Bible. I couldn't read one lick. I was 16 years old, driving my car to the fifth grade. And up in front of the fifth grade, and drive my car. Couldn't read, write, couldn't spell. As dumb as a lick. 16, 17, 18, 19. I'd re never read a first grade reader. 19 years old, and I'd never read a first grade reader. Run, Dick, Jane, Jane, see Dick, down, run, Jane. I don't know what that was all about. Never did learn it. I'm 19 years old. God saved me and said, uh, I want you to uh, read the Bible. I, somebody give me a Gideon Bible. I took that Gideon Bible and opened up that Gideon Bible. And I'd, all I had to do is hear the word read right there in my throat. I'd hear the word read. I opened up that Gideon Bible and I want flim floppers, plume floppers, and there's a word I know, and plume floppers, flip floppers, flume floppers, the I know that bird. And I didn't get a lump. I didn't get a lump right there. And that Bible right there said that this is the first time in my entire life that it didn't get a lump when I read a book. And that lump was so big, it would choke me, I couldn't even talk. I was that far from bawling and crying at 20 years old. I would bawl and cry when I heard the word read. Read! read. Nathan, read! I'd slam that book and say, that's the last time you'll ever see me, bud. And I had to tell out there, and they'd never see hiding or hair of me again. Now I got a whole bunch of books on my shelf. Must have been, I mean, there must be a hundred books there, and I've read them. <laughs> Woo! 
You say, what did God save you from, preacher? God saved me and gave me a purpose for living and dying. You got to remind him of what God saved him from to get him started again. And he get dead on the side of the road. He thinks this world's it. This world ain't it. This world ain't it, brother. And you trust God, and God will take care of you. I went never been to the sixth grade. I know I didn't even finish the fifth the fifth grade. I went two weeks to the fifth grade. That was it. But I had my car full of eight. I had a car full of go, boys and girls out there. The teacher looked out the window and said, "Nathan will kill them all." I got kicked out of the fifth grade because I had too many kids in my car. <laughs> You say, how in the world did you ever make it? God took care of me. I said, God, here am I. Here am I. Oh, God, do something with me. There ain't much, but God do it. He says, yeah, that's what I've been looking for. <laughs> I've been looking so many, ain't got anything. <laughs> ain't got anything. He can't do nothing. I'll have to do it all. That's what he wants to do anyway. He wants to do it all anyway. He don't want me to do anything anyway. So I can't do nothing. So I didn't do nothing. So he did it all. He can do the same for, for you if you'll say, get up dead on the side of the road and say, oh God, oh God, thank you for saving me from hell. Oh God, thank you for saving me from hell. You want know God saved you from? He saved you from a man out in the lake of fire with fire rolling down this arm, fire rolling down this arm, and fire rolling down his face, screaming and saying, God, be merciful! Oh, God, give me mercy! I hate this flame! Oh, God, be merciful to me, a sinner! He's too late. He's in hell. God saved you from hell. That's all He did, save you from hell. You ought to be back in there doing something for God. Remind him of what God saved him from. And then you can get him going again back on the, on the right road. Write it down. To get him started again dead in the side of the road. My Bible says, who did hinder you from obeying the truth? Who? Circle the who. There's always a who. You know why Christians stay dead on the side of the road? Because there's always a who. Now, I don't know who they is. Maybe the who's your best girlfriend. Maybe it's your best girlfriend. Maybe, maybe that's who the who is. Maybe the who's one of your buddies. I don't know who they is. But it don't make any difference who they is because there's always a who there to mess you up. Now, did you get it? There's always a who there to mess you up and get you sidetracked. It don't make any difference who the who is. Drop him like a hot potato and get rid of him. Or get rid of her. They mess you up and they're getting you dead on the side of the road. Don't mess with them. You do what they'll do and they'll, you'll start thinking like they think and you'll start acting like they think and you'll be dead on the side of the road as sure as you live and breathe, even if they are your best friend. Thank you. Now, got it? It's your best friend. That's the one that killed you. <laughs> Dead on the side of the road. You got to do this. Uh, you got to write it down. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. And you'll be dead on the side of the road if you don't do this. If you don't do it, you'll be dead on the side of the road. I've seen many a Christian dead on the side of the road because he wouldn't do it. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 says, Looking unto who? Looking unto who? Then write it down. You got to get his eyes off of other people, get his eyes off of things, get his eyes off of himself, and get his eyes back on Jesus. Get his eyes back on Jesus. Do you know what you do when you start looking at other people in this church? You get looking at so and so, you get looking over to here, and you get looking over there, and you get looking at each other. Get your eyes off of Jesus. You get looking at them and you go, 
You know, they shouldn't be doing this. Uh, they shouldn't be doing that. Uh, they shouldn't be doing that. You know, you know, they, they shouldn't be doing that. That, that, that's just, just, that ain't right. Uh, that's just, well, I mean, you know, they're, they're just a bunch of hypocrites. You got looking at somebody else. You look at me long enough and you'll find my sin. Amen. You look at anybody long enough, you'll find their sin. Just watch them hard enough, you'll find mistakes wrong with anybody. You know what happens to the Christian? Gets his eyes off of, off of the Lord, gets them over here like that, and gets his eyes on them like that, and starts looking at them all the time like that. He starts finding all the faults with them. He becomes a hypercritic, and then he starts criticizing, and then he gets dead on the side of the road. You become a hypercritic critic. You can become such a critic inside you can find something wrong with everybody. I can find it wrong with you too. If I don't know, I'll just ask your wife. Sit down and say, now, he's a good man here in the church, and he's a good man on the job, and he's a good man everywhere else, but how does he treat you at home? Now, I, just, I would just like to know, just between uh, the Lord, me, you, and the devil... How does he treat you here personally in his personal life between you and him? What kind of guy is he? Be honest, be honest, don't 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 save his feeling. Be honest. Tell me right straight away. And you know what happened? I I, I get a whole bunch of folks. You know what happened? Because they got their eye on somebody instead of on Jesus. Don't you don't you look too hard at him, don't you look too hard at her. You get your eyes on Jesus. You look too hard at your husband, you'll quit. You look too hard at your wife, you'll quit. You look too hard at your preacher, you'll quit. You look too hard at me, you'll quit. You look too hard at anybody. You're going to fight. I'm a sinner! What do you think I was? A, not a sinner? How many think I sinned? My wife would raise both hands. <laughs> but she's right. I'm a sinner. What do you expect? Get your eye on Jesus. You know what the guy over here? I was driving down the farmland one day, and I saw this great big old white bucket on the fence. White bucket on the fence. I went out in the field, said uh, to the farmer, I said, why the white bucket on the fence? I kind of had an idea. But I said, why the white bucket on the fence? He said, when I plow the first row, I file the first row. I want that first row to be just as straight as it can be. So I put that little thing on the top of my tractor right up here and I look right through it and I set that white bucket right in the middle and I shoot that tractor right for that white bucket. And that line, my plow, that first row just as straight as it can be. You know, some of you got to get your eye on Jesus and get your eye off of somebody else and you got to get your eye off of the who and start serving God again. Who are you serving? Are you serving Jesus Christ? Are you serving God? Or are you serving me? I'm the wrong guy to serve. People are the wrong people to serve. Are you, are you in this church because God put you here? How many of you are here because God put you here? Raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 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 be a critic. Be, be just a hypercritic and just be that away and just say, I'll preach you that just a and then say dead on the side of the road if that's what you want to be. God will let you spend the next 20 years doing nothing for Him. He'll let you just sit down and do nothing. If that's what you want to do, live your own life and do your own thing. It's a wasted life! Down a rat hole! You're throwing a beautiful thing away. 
Spend it for God. Spend it for God. Every eye closed and every head bowed. Oh, that you could get a Christian jump started. Now, maybe you know some Christian that needs jump starting. Maybe you know some Christian that's got a controversy. And they're, and they're too stubborn. They don't want to settle it. And they don't know how to settle it. I'll tell you how to settle it. Now, I'm going to help you tonight. I'm going to tell you how to settle a controversy. You've got to decide in your heart and mind that you're going to do something about it. Now, are you going to do something about the controversy? Are you going to stay dead on the side of the road? There's no gas in the tank. Is that the way you're going to stay? There's no spark. There's no power. Is that the way you're going to stay? Or are you going to do something about it? Try something. Tell you what to try. I'm going to give you an invitation now to get up, come down this old-fashioned altar. Somebody going to say, oh, there they go again. Well, don't you look at somebody else. You look at God and say, oh, God, I gotta, I'm got. i dead on the side of the road and i got to get something from me. I'm in a rut, man. I, Oh, God, I want to get back to doing something for you again. You need to get up and you need to come with a heart saying, God, okay, God, I'll deal with the issue. I'll deal with it. And God, you got to work a miracle or you got to work something. God, you got to do something. Now, God, you got to do something with me. Now, here it is. I'll talk about the whole thing. Now, will you? Will you? If you will, let's all stand right now. We're going to sing hymn number three, number 94 now. God spoke to your heart. Come on. You've got to do something. Now do it now. For the way is to surrender all for him I gaily give. Uh, come on. God spoke to your heart. Now's the time to come. Somebody else ain't going to do it for you. Come on. Now I'll tell you what to do. Get somebody to come with you. Say, okay, I need somebody to go with me. Now if you've got to have somebody to go with you, get somebody to go with you. But come on, settle the controversy. And if you've got to have somebody to go with you, go with them. But settle the controversy. Maybe they're part of the controversy. Will you? I can't make you do it. God won't make you do it. But God wants you to. Will you? Will you say yes to God? Come on. Every eye closed and every head bowed. He that cometh to me, Jesus said, I will in no wise cast out. Now, he meant exactly what he said. I will in no wise cast out. If you come, it'll be settled. And then the controversy will be over. He forgives and he forgets. Now, you listening to me? He forgets. Will you come? Come on. Let's turn you and him. Will you come? Now's the time to settle it. Right now. Right now. One more. Let's go. Let me try to end up all to him I really give. Come on, come on, now's the time. Step out and come. This is the place. This is the place. This is the right place. You got Christians praying for you? 
you got the Holy Spirit on your side. You got God saying now. But it, it's still up to you. You're going to say, oh, you know what you're saying? You say, what is so and so thinking? It's immaterial what so and so thinks. You get it right with God, and that'll settle the issue. You get it right, and then maybe they'll get it right. If if you think they're holding things up, you make the first step, and they might say, okay, I will too. <laughs> say, okay, I, I will too. If you will, I will. Now, don't you be holding nobody up. You say, okay, I'll go, and I'll trust God, and maybe they will too. Step out, come on. Thank you.